Good morning. Welcome to Cybersecurity, the new frontier. This course is set up as a more practical managerial guide to cybersecurity. Of course, you'll end up learning things such as um, the technical aspects of cybersecurity, but to realize, first thing to know, regardless of how much of a cybersecurity professional you are or plan to be, cybersecurity is not a technical problem or not just a technical problem. It's a technical problem, it's a process problem, and it's a people problem. So the minute you combine the two, or the minute you forget to combine all three, you're likely to miss out or be a bit remiss in what you're trying to achieve. So let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity, the next frontier. The map you see out here is a map from uh, Kaspersky Labs, which is very famous. I think the, um, you could you could try it out. It's called, um, let's see, I think its name is cybermap.kaspersky, P-E-R-S-K-Y dot com. If you are to visit the cybermap, dot Kaspersky dot com website at any given point of time this is what you're going to encounter it basically shows you a real-time trace of events happening all around the world you see what's coming in what's going out you see all these threats you see these attacks you see various different forms of vulnerabilities across the world that are being impacted and accepted. If you look at it, you'll see that Europe out there is being constantly bombarded by somebody or some company or some group or some nation state trying to steal information, trying to find a, a vulnerability in a computer, in a utility system. The same thing with the United States. Out here, it also shows you which parts of the world are basically doing well. You see the east and the west coast in the United States and following this very interesting line, which is also the line through which the backbones, the internet backbone is carried forward. This is what Europe looks like. You see parts of Venezuela, Mexico, uh, Brazil, Argentina, then, of course, you find places like Moscow, western part of Russia, the rest, rest of it is dim. Uh, parts of um, Israel, India, and large parts of China, and some parts of Hong Kong right out there. rest of it basically is not an interesting piece for hackers mainly because they know that the connection hubs lie there. So you've got hundreds of millions of connected devices. You've got things like internet at home where you're being able to control things. You've got utility systems where fault tolerance maps and whether a gas bulb ought to be open or closed or whether um, uh, a transformer load ought to be changed is done digitally. You've got these smart homes, autonomous cars, electric grids. You've got serial hackers that are lurking in the dark. You've got loads and loads of chances of identities, healthcare data being compromised, companies being wrought havoc upon. And as we talk more, you'll see how these things change. Nonetheless, the game is afoot. So you're trying to protect digital borders in a, in a world where a digital assault is way easier and way more profound than a physical military assault. So cybersecurity basics. Let's talk about what we will be learning over the semester. First, what is it? Cybersecurity includes protecting information and systems. So cybersecurity is protecting both information as well as systems, which basically means it's not just protecting systems if you haven't been able to protect the information. Let me give you an example. If you have the best system in the world, 
but every day you print out information from that system and carry it with you and you lose that information in a coffee shop the information is still compromised regardless of how good the system is from major cyber threats originating from around the world such as cyber terrorism cyber warfare and cyber espionage cyber terrorism is when groups or nation states or anybody else whether it's an individual or a group tries to harm somebody else or create a fear or a sense of terror among others by using some kind of an internet based system now do realize things like cyber bullying and cyber stalking are also becoming parts of cyber terrorism because you're causing terror cyber warfare this is when there are legitimate attempts to break into systems or to try and break into systems that have some kind of national importance and thirdly cyber espionage now cyber espionage is the stealing of company data just like industrial espionage industrial espionage has just gone cyber you're trying to get into companies to find out what they're working on what products they plan to release when they plan to release it what are the new innovations are they shelving some are they pushing some forward how are they planning on pricing it these become parts of cyber espionage so once again cyber security you protect information and systems from major cyber threats originating from around the world it's a global problem not a local or regional problem these include cyber terrorism cyber warfare and cyber espionage now why is it important firstly countries companies and individuals rely on networks in the cloud as we even run this course you'll realize this is being delivered to you by the cloud which is basically the internet anything that's being delivered to you over a virtual remote machine connected by a network you're automatically falling prey to the others who are lurking in the background that you don't know can't see have no idea about and are ready to steal information from you if they can what are the risks firstly risks of stealing information whether it's credit cards social security numbers company innovations and then risks of controlling devices such as malware and denial of service so dos stands for denial of service malware nothing but mal basically means bad and it's a bad software is called a malware it's mainly meant to take different forms and at the end of the day try and control your systems uh, wreak havoc on different systems and so forth so you're either trying to steal information or you're trying to control devices and what are the reasons the first reasons say main three reasons are it depends on technology it depends upon processes it depends upon people you have firstly technological problems there's so much technology every day so much software being written so many apps being run that simply you don't really know what the repercussions of running every single set is now companies like apple will always try to do a better job by creating closed systems the closed systems mean that they try to control every part of the puzzle which means once you write an app you have to submit it to apple for them to review your app and ensure that all the codes in sync with what you want it to run the idea behind that is it's no third party independent code running that hasn't been tested verified and quality controlled by apple so while that is a closed system the other closed system that apple does is you'll typically find that none of its phones or ipads will ever carry an external connect or external uh, storage system because the minute you connect an external storage like um small drive or an, a mini 
SD card, you're automatically opening the system up to vulnerabilities because the SD card, which is not controlled by the system itself, could carry some kind of um, malware that could infect your machine. So you've got malware. Zero day attacks. Zero day attacks are attacks that hackers try to run on systems the very day a software is released. You have to realize the very days anything is being released or anything is being introduced into a system, it is vulnerable because you really don't know. Think of the first time you've ever gone and been someplace or visited some place or met somebody. You've always been a little bit at, um, you know, a little bit uneasy, a little bit um, in terms of um, trying to feel the layout of the land and all that. And it's the easiest to fall prey on that day. So zero day attack is that are there those attacks that um, hackers carry on on companies and so forth and on software that are being released on the very first day of release. Then of course you've got hacks, which are systems where, or a mechanism by which people, organizations and groups try to find vulnerabilities in a code or vulnerabilities in a system, which basically means that a port is open. Think of a system being very much like a house. If you've got three or four doors to enter the house and you leave one door unlocked or a window a bit ajar, and somebody's trying to get into the house, they'll try and find every possible way to get in. So it may not just be the software, it could mainly be it could even be the system, it could even be the device itself. And finally, there are things related to cryptography, which is the way to encrypt data so that it cannot be traced even if it's lost. So cryptography allows you to hide the meaning of the same message by encrypting it in a certain format. When there's a failure in cryptography and people can enter the system or have access to the information, they can read the information. So one big part is technology. However, technology does not rule the roost. Every technology is basically the mistress of a process. If the process is problematic, the best technology is likely to fail. So process could be things like you have single security. Anybody, for example, who has a card can gain access to a system. It seems convenient, but may not be the best thing in the world. Because anybody, therefore, who has the card would, therefore, be able to access a system. Defective processes, a part where somebody can enter the wrong information or put some information where it could make a system crash. That's a defective process. Problems with encryption, where you are creating a system where you're just getting the data the way it's inputted, which basically means that anybody else who can access the system will also be able to read the data. It's very much like um, losing an information, but the minute you've lost the information, you've also compromised its own setup. Then, of course, you have something like sniffing. Sniffing is a mechanism that hackers and so forth use, whose main job is to look at open networks, like unsecured networks that we join. And because these are unsecured networks that you've joined, there are no passwords, anybody else can join the system and then they can stop sniffing the data packets that are flowing from one place to another. And if you watch the video on how the internet works, you'll see that this is how these packets move. And if you can figure out what these packets belong, it's like solving a puzzle or solving a cipher. And you'll be able to know exactly what kind of information you're carrying. Third part, but the most important, people. People are always the weakest links in the system. You can have the best system, but if you've got bad practices and people who are either negligent 
resistant to change or sometimes simply deliberately malevolent. You can't have a good system running. There are people, but there are stories about from NASA and NSA and the FBI where the best kept systems have been compromised because somebody just entered some information into a USB file and took it and carried it and walked out with them. So you can have the best system, but suddenly the minute you give, give an employee or anybody else, a vendor who's working there, a chance to just copy system or copy information on a USB file and carry it out with him or her, you've suddenly compromised the system. And people oftentimes are the greatest weakness or the biggest weakness in the, in the chain. We tend to create easy passwords, forget things, misplace stuff. So people and cybersecurity training of people is very, very, very important. So you have to understand that if you are to look at it, technology is everywhere. The minute technology is everywhere, the chances of intrusion and the chances of stealing information everywhere too. You've got malware. Malware are nothing but creepy crawlers that you unknowingly download and can steal your information, such as spyware, keylogger. Spyware, you'll oftentimes find it, especially if you go to torrent sites to download movies or whatever it is, or some dodgy site. Now, they'll oftentimes try and um, sort of force download a bit of um, spyware onto your computer. And the minute you say that, sure, I want to download the latest um, copy of Guardian Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, you might have downloaded a lot of spyware that comes with it. Keyloggers, so spyware basically will spy on your machine and will send information through an internet connection without you knowing about it. About it. Keyloggers are nothing but they log every keystroke. Now, every logging every case track is very interesting because there was once a case uh, at um, something mail stop or mailboxes, which is used to be an internet cafe, and there was one person who was operating the store also had the permissions to change to install software on the computer, which basically means it was a story about separation of duties so the same person who could manage this tool could now also install software on the computer which basically meant that this person had too much control what this person did was he installed a key logging software onto all the computers all that software did was log keystrokes of everybody signing on to the system, which basically means that if somebody were to sign on to a bank website at, at an internet cafe, the keylogger would log every single keystroke about where they logged in, what their username was, what their passwords are, and now they could use that, and that's exactly what that person did. Stole possibly a hundred thousand dollars or so from people's banks before he was arrested. So they'll try to take over your computer using a backdoor or different dialers. So they'll use backdoor techniques such as some spyware will keep some ports open so that even when you don't know it, somebody else can use a system to access into your machine and get information from you. They can use dialers which are nothing but remote ways to access and called some other computer to get them awake and pass information. They can force ads through adware or even can corrupt your files with viruses or viri. And now you know that it's the day that the days have changed where instead of saying the dog ate my homework, you hear nowadays people saying the virus ate my homework. Next thing is phishing. Phishing is nothing but a false or spoofed email that links you to a false website 
and looks exactly like the original site, such as your bank, to steal your user ID and password. So, phishing tries to be a very focused approach towards creating a false site that will look exactly like the real site, but suddenly you might get an email that will say, by the way, I think you have, um, um, your Kent website um, was compromised and could you please click on this link so that uh, you can upgrade or update your password or reset your password. What you're clicking on, unless you're absolutely sure, and if it's unless it's the legitimate website that says www.ken.edu, a phishing site might say something like 121.123.10.52, an IP address that's been spoofed. You're likely to fall prey. So always check for HTTPS, HTTPS and the S out here stands for Secure Socket Slayer. It's basically it's secure encrypted. So that's a basic line of defense. And also check for the validity of the name of the site itself. DOS and DDOS, denial of service and distributed denial of service. Nothing but sending a lot of queries where you're overwhelming a website by sending millions of false requests. And then the dreaded website is not available. Very much like you're going up to a counter and you disguising yourself, assume you could clone yourself into 500 people. And you overwhelm a counter with 500 people and everybody else behind you gets stuck. Even though you're creating false requests at the counter, nobody else can access the counter very much the way they can't access the website. Then you've got something called man in the middle. So this is taking over your connection over an open network to steal your information. Someday there are systems that will basically assume the connection in between you and the bank so that when they assume the connection they act as the man in the middle and every bit of information you send they get to read every information that you're sending before you can send it over to your bank or to your company's intranet or whatever it is then of course you've got hacking hacking is a process by which um, People who understand technology and systems try to find vulnerabilities in technology to gain access to do harm. For example, you know, there are stories of people that you can even remotely control a Chrysler Jeep. Because do realize a lot of the systems that we run, even in our cars, are computerized systems. Nowadays, cars are getting more and more connected. Even if they are not connected, systems are run so closely. Oftentimes, you can just add a module into the um, ABD controller, which is basically your um, or OBD connect controller, which is your onboard diagnostics controller, the typical one where um, your dealership might plug a line in to find out all the error codes. But that onboard controller could subtly wreak havoc into your car. And there are stories, and we might even point you to a um, YouTube video where you'll see cars being controlled remotely because they're being hacked. So what should you do to protect? Firstly, make sure you have your antivirus in play. You have your latest updates. Avoid some sites, such as torrent sites, pornography sites. Connect securely. Anytime you get a chance to connect via a WPA or a password access Wi-Fi versus an, an open Wi-Fi, try to go through um, password activated Wi-Fi. Encrypt. Try and get an encryption kit that will encrypt all the information on your machine so that even if it's hacked, they have no way of knowing what the information actually means. So encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. This is a story of how the world has changed into a set where cyber security or cyber warfare can change the rules of the game. This is a story of, um, of an interesting 
worm, in fact a malware called Stuxnet and Stuxnet was created by people still don't know exactly who it was but it was a series of um, senders from the Netherlands, the US, supposedly it was US, Israel and um, Western Europe who after years of deliberating on trying to stop Iran's nuclear ambitions created this very interesting software called Stuxnet. So Stuxnet was a very interesting piece of the puzzle. It's a malicious computer worm which entered the computer system through which which is normally cut off from the rest of the world because Iran doesn't allow normal people to have access to the internet. At the uranium enrichment facility in Natanz, which is a part of is a which is a place in Iran, through a USB memory stick. So somebody basically may have gone to a dodgy site where they might have been solicited by somebody to download something like the picture of a pretty girl possibly but while they downloaded some picture of a pretty girl they also downloaded the virus now this virus was very interesting this virus is con was controlled by servers in denmark and malaysia with the help of two internet addresses both registered to false names this virus infected over hundred thousand computers so many people could have downloaded the same picture however this was a smart virus. Stuxnet's main job was it spread through other systems till it finds computers that run. Siemens control software step 7, which is responsible for regulating the rotational speed of the centrifuges. So the centrifuge is what will typically maintain log, um, the centrifugal force to basically maintain uh, the reactor runs or the reactor operation in play. So although this software or this virus encrypted many computers, if your computer wasn't running Siemens uh, Step 7 software, it didn't really care. Its job was finding the computer that was finding the system that was running. Now, it was a Windows system. Now the computer worm varied the rotational speed of the centrifuges. This can destroy the centrifuges and impair uranium enrichment. So this is exactly where it hit. So the Stuxnet, attacks, Stuxnet attack started in June 2009. From that point of time, the number of inoperative centrifuges increased sharply. So what the world could not do with sanctions, they could actually do with cyber warfare. And this is the level of involvement that cyber warfare and cyber crime and cyber threats can have on whether it's a country, a company, an individual, it matters not. So you have to, so that's a story of a process. Then of course you have people. You have to secure the weakest links. Things like shoulder sniffing, where <clears throat> while you're doing your work at an airport, at a bus stop, uh, logging onto your phone um, in a public place, people might be able to look into what you're typing. Somebody could simply be pointing the phone's camera at you and not looking at you, but the camera might, might be quietly recording every single thing that you're doing. You've got dumpster diving where people tend to be careless when they're at their homes and you might be very very cautious while you're at your workplace but when you bring your work back home you dump them in your rubbish bin. And if I were to be somebody who does industrial espionage I would simply pay a rubbish collector money to collect every single bit of rubbish from your house and bring them over because there's likely there's a likelihood that you might find documents in there that mean something so you either shred it or shred it properly or make 
make sure that you're not carrying these things home. And then passwords. People tend to be very, very um, casual with their passwords. And if you look at it, the top 20 most common passwords have been things like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 4.2%. Uh, password for password, 1.3% of people. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. And it goes on and on. Because you'll realise we are we believe in mnemonics. And we also believe in the fact that we want to be able to remember things. So we try to create root passwords, which is either... Um, word number combination or so that we really like or that means something to us and once that's done we try to embellish those a little bit for different sites and we are very happy and we rest awesome you know rest on our laurels knowing that hey that's easy however if one of the sites that has less security is compromised your root password is also compromised so, to finish off, 2016, this is data from 2016 and this data, the gap's increasing. There's a cybersecurity skills gap. There are too many threats. A billion personally identifiable information records stolen in 2014. $150 million is the average cost of a data breach. 97% believe that APIs, which are nothing but connections to different databases and companies, represent credible threat to national security and um, APTs. So, so you've got these advanced and persistent threats. So APTs stand for advanced persistent threats. So which basically means these are sophisticated malware. They are persistent, which means they act slowly but over time, and they are designed to cause harm. To national security and economic stability, one in two believe that the IT department is unaware of the, organi of the organization's Internet of Things devices. We could be putting in something like a Nest uh, thermostat controller. We could start off with uh, autonomous cars. We could have Apple Watches. Suddenly, the connection of the problem in one creates problems for many. More than one in four organizations experience an APT attack. So once again, APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threats. And 74% believe the likelihood of organizations being hacked um, through IoT devices is high or medium. On the other hand, you have very few professionals. There's 2 million global people in terms of global shortage of cybersecurity professionals. 53% of organizations experience delays as long as six months to find qualified security candidates. Three times the rate of cybersecurity job growth. Um, versus IT jobs, which itself has the one of the largest growths in the world. 77 of women said that no high school teacher or guidance counsellor ever mentioned cybersecurity as career. For men, it's only 47%. 84% organisations believe half or fewer of applicants for open security jobs are qualified. 89% consumers believe that it's important for organizations to have cybersecurity certified employees. So we do need you. And I hope this turns out to be a useful um, adventure and a jolly good show. Thank you.